my i consider it an absolute privilege to be seated in front of the legend uh, prof samran nandi in the post independent india very few surgeons have reached the heights that dr nandi has reached and i thought uh, it's very apt to spend time with him when i come to delhi and uh, this is an absolute privilege welcome sir to this uh, um, chit chat show i'm very pleased to be with my old trainees one of my most successful trainees who has done such a great job not only in surgery but in spreading the world of surgery of high class surgery it's a privilege for me which place do you originate from which part of bengal i don't actually originate from bengal because my father was a surgeon in the indian medical service which was very prestigious and after he served in the second world war and after that he was um became professor of surgery and he was a legend surgeon in rangoon and professor of surgery and um he um i was born in rangoon but i i was, was sent to a very expensive indian boarding school in darjeeling which is called st paul's which was all staffed by english headmasters and one of the things i remember from my headmaster called mr godard said that you people are all privileged and you should do something for people who are less privileged than you and that stuck to me all my life as a very idealistic young man you have any uh, remembrance of your grandparents uh, your early childhood yeah my grandfather was a very eminent my mother's family was very eminent and they were called talukdars and they were land owners in east bengal now bangladesh and he was a rai bahadur and a lawyer and uh, when i was in school one of the chief justices called sir thomas ellis used to take me out and said that my grandfather was well known for misquoting shakespeare all the time in in uh, court and he was a great anglophile so i became an anglophile after him so you from a very privileged background yeah i was from a background because after school i went to cambridge at the age of 17 and a half and um, my mother's family was much more prominent than my father's and they wanted me to join the foreign service but one day i heard my mother and father arguing uh, i'd got into cambridge and uh, much easier those days and uh, uh, i said well i did everything for my mother i became very anglicized and all that but i'll do something for my father so uh, instead of going into uh, foreign service i decided to do medicine how much did your father influence you in your life how close were you to your father i think my father influenced me in that he was very academic and he was a uh, honorary fellow of the american college of surgeons he was one of the only five people and he said they sent a plane for him to go to los angeles for the investiture with a general niece from honolulu and i remember all that and but he was very hard working and all the people who been trained by him and he used to prepare lectures i remember till about 2 in the morning and he traveled all over the world giving lectures so whatever i have achieved had been much less than my father in fact because i was privileged but he came from an under privileged family but he i think achieved much more than i did did you have conversations very little because being in boarding school from the age of 7 or 8 you get a bit alienated from your parents and uh, we were in school for 9 months of the year and uh, it was very difficult to bond with the family and that's why my 
parents always thought that uh, and my children <laughs> would never send their children to boarding school because it makes you a different kind of person much more hard because you have to survive with other children who are bullies and this and the other and you were very close to your mother yeah i was close to my mother very close to my mother and uh, she and my grandfather were very disappointed that i became a doctor because in those days I, doctors were not very high up socially it was civil servants and in fact people who worked with foreign firms and all this and doctors were kind of second class now it's changed completely now when i was in cambridge there was someone who did a study of the intelligence quotient of the people who undergraduates and the people who did medicine were the lowest and the people who did greek and latin were the highest but a friend of mine contemporary who became director of studies of st john's college said that in about 10 years 15 years it all changed because now to get into medicine was the most difficult of all you not only have to get straight a's but you also had to do play cricket for the county or do long jump in the olympics otherwise you just couldn't get in the whole thing has changed why well, you have siblings brothers sisters or you are the only child no i have two sisters one was um married to a well known family he was the mp for birbhum trajikitan and uh, they so th they she was married early went away my younger sister was very talented she came second in the all india golf championship but and she had got into oxford because professor butterfield who taught me in cambridge had got her a place in lady margaret hall but uh, she got married instead so that part uh, she got first class everywhere but that changed her life because she became the wife of a tea planter and stopped all education but continued to play golf till she died last year but that was the period your youth was when uh, bengal had the best of uh, literary figures best of music best of movie makers uh, have you learned bengali to read write have you li read literature and do you have any other extracurricular interests other than uh, your schooling while you were young um external no the the bengal yeah at that point of time yeah it was very, very culture very yeah. culture yeah did it and by to? this so we my mother was a great singer and uh, we used to have these people coming home and giving recitals and uh, she used to play the piano and the great thing about my mother was that you know i have a handicapped niece who um, spastic and uh, my mother at the age of when my father went to canada just before he retired and my mother went to university in brandon manitoba at the age of 54 and she did special education and came back to calcutta and she uh, worked in the spastic school and she worked for men mentally disadvantaged and physically disadvantaged children and she used to play the piano every morning for the morning uh, classes and even when we went down we were very poor in all india stud and we had a grand house in calcutta uh, which is not so grand now because it's all built up but uh, even when we went down for holidays she insisted on going to school so she was very dedicated and those were the best years of her life she said 
looking after physically disadvantaged children. So that was a influence on me because I don't think that we were ever brought up to think that we should be rich but we should not only from my school headmaster but from my mother and father I suppose we were brought up to try and help other people. But you weren't into Bengali literature, studying literature? None, zero. And they used to laugh at me when I went to see my relatives in Calcutta. He, they used to say, you know, I came back from England once in three years. In those days, it was very expensive. So I couldn't afford every year. And they used to say, what is this Bengali uh, son, son of Bengal? He doesn't speak Bengali properly. So I never learned how to speak Bengali properly or Hindi properly, may I say, after being in India for so long. So how was your medical school? How was your days in medical school? Uh, under My medical school, I went to Cambridge and I did quite well. And uh, then I, in those days, we did three years of undergraduate and three years in London in a hospital. And I was the top, uh, uh, I got the gold medal in medicine, in guys. And my person who taught me medicine was uh, Professor Butterfield, who actually became Lord Butterfield and uh, Vice Chancellor of Cambridge. So he supported me and he was very happy that I went back to India, considering that I had done quite well in uh, as an undergraduate and he supported me all the time and when I was very upset couldn't adjust to All India Institute um, he told my wife that if he is unhappy we take him back to Cambridge and I'll send you three tickets tomorrow so that was something and I said this in a talk I gave in Rishikesh that if you uh, work hard as an undergraduate, your um, teachers will help you all the time. Now, uh, do you remember any contemporaries or class fellows who made it big in life from your undergraduate? Lots of them. Lots. I remember a person called Irwin Zement who became professor of medicine in Los Angeles, who's a great friend of mine. And uh, I used to stay with him when I went to America. He had a beautiful house with, and he did a lot of work on uh, respiratory medicine. And there were a lot of them who did very well. So that has something to do with the institution. People becoming famous has to do with the institution where you studied. Uh, in the atmosphere, the mentorship, etc. Did uh, the, the college, the Cambridge help them build? Them yeah, house? I went to Gonville and Keys College, Cambridge, mm -hmm. which was the most prestigious for medicine, and where, where William Harvey, who discovered the circulation of blood, he was a student, as well as Sir Charles Sherrington, and. I think that the college had more Nobel Prize winners than Russia. So, like Sir James, when I was there, there was a person called James, Sir James Chadwick, physicist, who was the master, who at first discovered the neuron, a neutron, and uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. So there were a lot of people, like a person called Sir Joseph Needham, who wrote 12 books on the science and civilization of China. So it was a very good um, background. And I think the great thing about going to a place like Cambridge was, because I did very well in school, and, uh, and I thought that, oh, I was top dog and all that. But when I went to Cambridge, I found that there were people who were so much better than me. And they not only were very good in studies, they could play the piano well 
and they were very good cricketers. It was quite amazing that one found that there were people, you know, you got a sense of not inferiority but reality that in India you were so great but when you went abroad and competed with the others it was much more tough. Did you start your research activities during your undergraduation? Not much but I did my first paper when I was a uh, demonstrator in anatomy. After I finished um, you see, I always wanted to work in a village in India and to because I was good in medicine, I said I'll try getting both MRCP and FRCS and that will help me to work in a village. I'll deal with medicine as well as surgery. So luckily I passed MRCP first and then I got a job with Lord Brock who was a cardiothoracic surgeon and then I went, I was invited to teach anatomy in Cambridge and my first paper was with a friend of mine called Michael Edgar um, and we published a paper on the nerve supply of the spinal duromator which was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery and I've got it up there and the story is that we went to the professor of pathology in Cambridge saying that could we dissect these uh, corpses and to do this uh, work. So uh, Mike Edgar said, uh, he said, why do you want to do it? So he said that, well, I'm very interested in, in how the durometer supplied by nerves were. And then he asked me, why do you want to do it? So I said, I want to see my name in print. And because I said the truth that uh, he told us that, because Nandi had said the truth, I allowed you to do it. So we did it and we published the paper. That was my first paper. How did you get into surgery? I did surgery because I wanted to come back to India. I wanted to, all my life, wanted to serve the poor. My, I mean it sounds very odd now, but my ambition in life was to give the best treatment in the world to the poorest of the poor. I failed, but I tried. And so I did uh, medicine first, passed the MRCP, and after that I could get any surgical job. For instance, I got a job in uh, with Lord Brock. Uh, then I went to Hammersmith, which was the Royal Postgraduate Medical School. And uh, as a house surgeon, there was a person who had a duodenal fistula and leaking three or four liters a day. And I used to um, chart the output and input and put it on the wall in, you know, histograms. You had to draw them every day, not like now on the computers. And my boss was so impressed by all this. So he said, after you pass the FRCS, we'll give you a senior registrar job. And true to his word, the day I passed the FRCS, his secretary rang me and said, when do you want to join? So I became a senior registrar at Hammersmith at the age of 29, which was the youngest by far. But the interesting thing about the person who had the duodenal fistula was that he was dying and he was a Roman Catholic. And I asked him, his name was Norfolk. And I asked him, what do you, oh, they wanted to bring the give him the last rites. So the Roman Catholic priest came and saw him and said, what would you like? So he said, I want to have breakfast of porridge and scrambled eggs and bacon. For two months he hadn't eaten anything. We're giving parental nutrition. And he had porridge, 
scrambled eggs and bacon and the fistula healed and he went home and he gave me a gold parka fountain pen but the story is i took the parka fountain pen to the theater someone stole it in one day <laughs> in england how was uh, your uh, um, training in surgery because uh, the younger generation i mean what is your advice in terms of how should they uh, study the theory how should they get a hands on training how will they learn perioperative medicine how were you trained what was your my style? training was not so good in that when i was a registrar in cambridge there we got 10 people with appendicitis for instance a day and when i worked in hammersmith when i went for the interview they asked me what operations i had done so i said i had done one hernia assisted and piles one third of a piles and i hadn't done anything more and he said well but he said what do you want to do in the future i said i want to go back to india and out of 130 people i got the job and they were all very high flyers and but the when i went to um uh, okay admirox the my house surgeon had done 30 appendectomies and i had so he trained me how to do appendixes but to tell you the truth when i went back i used to do the end of the operation after the professor or mop up the bleeding and all that but except for emergencies i didn't have very good hands on training and uh, i operated a lot on monkeys and rats and i gave this lecture also about my experience in portal hypertension and uh, by the time i came back to india i oh yeah i wanted a job in india and the professor of surgery from all india institute came and uh, no the first was a group came from chandigarh and offered me a job as associate, associate professor in pgi but my wife didn't want to go to chandigarh so when the all india institute professor came and he offered me the job i resigned and uh, from my senior registrar job in hammersmith and uh, the job didn't come through and i was giving a lecture at the surgical research society on one of my dog experiments and after the lectures a person came up to me he said my name is uh, gerald austin i am head of surgery at the massachusetts general and i would like you to offer you a job of uh, assistant professor in harvard so i said this is wonderful and uh, i they got me a green card which is there within 3 months and uh, i was going to go th- stay there forever but my wife didn't like uh, uh, to live in america and she came and found that there was a job here of uh, assistant professor in all india institute so they were very angry with me and they said why don't you go and have a look i had no idea what it was like to work in india i came back and i found feces on the the floor in the casualty in all india institute i thought how can i get back here but i was staying with a friend of mine who was uh, mrs gandhi's press secretary who was a uh, foreign service officer and uh, he became governor of Arunur, arunachal later but i when i came down the stairs in the morning he was ringing up everyone on the selection committee saying i am mrs gandhi's press secretary and a friend of mine is applying for job as assistant professor and i would be grateful if you could see that justice is done so i was shocked i said i don't want the job so he said you'll never get the job and uh just like that because nobody wants you so i got the i got the job and i hated it 
for first three or four years, but managed to survive. How did you get married? Where did you find your wife? My uncle, who was a secretary, a IS officer, very glamorous type, um, was married to my wife's um, aunt, who was an actress, big only films, and so we knew each other for a long time from, you know, since we were children. And my wife went to um, New York to the World Fair and then she was a guide at the UN. And on the way back, she used to see me when I was in guise as an undergraduate. And then I thought we should get married and I asked her to marry me and she rejected me. But first she said she wanted to get to know me better. She became an air hostess for British Airways. And after she got to know me better, she got, uh, she decided she didn't want to marry me because I wasn't good enough and got engaged to an Englishman who was a, a publisher Oxford University Press in Calcutta. But after some time, my sister-in-law, who had a spastic child, uh, one, uh, rang me up when I was a house surgeon at Hammersmith and said that, did I know a person called Jack Tizard, who was a professor of uh, pediatrics because of a daughter who was handicapped. And she said, by the way, my sister wants to get married to you and if you come within two weeks. So I said, well, I'll ask. I'd got the job in Cambridge and I asked, can I go to get married? They said, no, we've all planned our holidays. You can only go in October. <laughs> so I went in October and got married. Were you an ideal husband? I was a very bad husband. Very bad husband in that we used to live in the servants' quarters of the chaplain in a beautiful house called Springfield in Sidgwick Avenue in Cambridge. And we used to live at the back upstairs. And I used to work very hard. And my wife was very scatty. And one day she put on the gas and lit a match and the whole thing blew up and singed her eyebrows. She was very, very upset. And then I got a call from the hospital to say that the child with a ruptured appendix and could you come in and operate. So I left her like that and I went to operate on the child. She never forgave me for that. that it was a problem of being a good family man and being a dedicated doctor. And I think all doctors have this problem. Can't be only me. You can't be, I said, you can't be a dedicated doctor to your patients as well as treat your family the way they want to be treated. If you had to reinvent the whole thing, would you be any different now? Suppose you would have been a better husband in retrospect. In retrospect, maybe I should have been a less hard as a person, but it's been difficult because my background has been boarding school and living by myself and uh, supporting myself. And I expect everyone else to do the same, which is probably not right if you're a family person. Have you been a good parent? I think I have been a good parent. Not very good. My wife brought up my uh, children, but I, I was in the All India Institute, very poor. I used to get 900 rupees a month when I came and we 
could never change our tires. And my wife, who is a great believer in Satya Sai Baba, and uh, our Puttabhatti, and even in spite of that, she said that you were given a very privileged background. My wife went to London School of Economics. I educated her because she wasn't educated before and she did very well. But uh, she said, we had a very good education and you have to resign from All India Institute and make money in the private sector. And that's why, I know Dr. Sama, who was the head of Gangaram at that time, came to me to about two years ago saying that we want to start a GI surgery department in Gangaram and would you come and what would you like, we'll give you everything you want. So I said, I want lots of money. I want to have, be able to choose uh, who I work with. I want to have security of tenure and I want to have an office. So he said, we'll give you everything, but we can't give you an office. But when I came to Gangaram, the only thing they did give me was a small little office that Dr. Rana, who is the chairman of the trust now, gave a small little office. So that I left to join the private sector only to educate my children. But my children did rather well in that my son got in, did very well in Washington University. Uh, no, uh, yeah, in St. Louis. Then he was recruited by Mass General and they wrote to him in the I know he went to Duke, did a PhD, and uh, in neuro, neurosurgery, neurology, mainly with computers. And uh, then he went to Mass General, and he stayed in the same block of flats where we were, Charles River Park, in a different block. And then he came back, mainly because my wife got sick, she got cardiac amyloidosis. And uh, he is now making, doing artificial intelligence and the application in medicine. So he's getting a big firm. My daughter went to Cambridge and did well, got lots of prizes. And now she's a lawyer. And last year, Time magazine put her as one of the hundred most influential people in the world. So I told her, why didn't they ask me, tell me <laughs> rather than you. So she went there and got the award. So she is a very prominent lawyer. Yeah. In the, she's on television every second day. Yeah. And she's very uh, is strong it, uh, on thanks to feminism. Father. Thanks uh. to father. Huh? What is the father's role in their children coming to that level? Did you mentor them? No, it's not my role. I think it's my wife's role in that they didn't want, they didn't stay abroad, although they did well, and they came back to India. One was because she was sick, and second was because she told them all the time that you must come back to India and serve the country. She was very strong on that. And Mrs. Nandi herself was a celebrity, and uh, she's done very well on her own. Uh, Who? Mrs. Nandi. Yeah. My wife started the Spastic Society. Do you remember in your day? And she got a huge grant from the British and, and the governor, Lieutenant Governor of Delhi gave them the land there, just in Goldmar Park. And they built a huge school, which is very successful. But my sister-in-law, who is the um, who had this plastic child, they, she's got, done fantastic thing in Bombay, in that they've got, for handicapped children, they've got three uh, different institutions, and she got the Padma Shri, and she's now branched out into, I think, 25 centers in India. And I'm very pleased to say, that I'm president of that ADAPT, which is able, disabled, all people together. 
So they've done, I think my wife's achievements and especially my sister-in-law's achievements are much greater than mine. Because I was only a minor surgeon, but they influenced a lot of people and I think people said that the index of civilization of a country is how they look after the disadvantaged and they've shown this. Did you have good friends among medical people, among non-medical people? No, well, I'm very good friends among uh, mainly non-medical people. Medical people, my unfortunately, my really good friends are from abroad, from England and America. In non-medical people, there are a lot of people who came back the same time as I did, who became very prominent. And uh, Pranoy Roy Television, who started NDTV, and I used to appear on the program every one, once every two or three weeks. And people knew me then. And uh, I think it was the only, <laughs> it was a very popular program. Do you remember yeah, it? Yeah, The World This Week. The World This Week, yeah. And I used to discuss different um, medical subjects. And uh, Pranoy, then Arun Shori, who came back from the World Bank, and Bimal Jalan, who became governor of the Reserve Bank. So all these are very good friends of mine. They're still very good friends of mine. So we meet other, you know, fairly. You, I remember on Saturdays, you had to spend time with your in-laws. And DLF Kutubenklev? Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. I used to go to DLF. They had a house in DLF. Uh, you, you've been very close to your in-laws? Yeah, yeah, I was. And uh, that, I tell everyone the story of my experience of bribery and corruption. Because I helped them build that house in DLF. And they were quite old. And uh, the house was complete a person came for the completion certificate and he wanted 600 rupees because he said there was something deficient, a bribe. So my father-in-law, I was in All India Institute then, my father-in-law rang me up saying that he wants 600 rupees. My father-in-law was very straight and he would never think of bribing anyone. So he asked me, what shall I do? I said, give him the 600 rupees and that's my own. <laughs> only <laughs> thing of bribery, my experience of personal bribery. But I thought that in the end, poor things, he said that they would reinspect the house six months later and they had already given up their old house, rented house. Very complicated. I think ethics in India is very complicated. And what would you have done? What would anyone have done? 600 isn't anything at all. <laughs> now, how, what is the secret of your fitness and health? You are 80 plus and so fit and so energetic and working so hard. Is it your genes, your food, your physical activity? What I think it? genes and also I exercise every morning. And also I think that I've been told that unless you work, you either go up or you go down. You, you don't remain the same. And medicine has been my life, and I don't want to give it up. So you, you eat very little, very little you eat. I notice that your lunch will be a sandwich and a That's right. Amru lunch, I have a banana, apple and a guava. That's all the lunch? Uh, no, and lassi. And lassi or, or milkshake. trick. And I have it here. And That's enough. Yeah, we have been, even in all India Institute has to have that. Right. You remember? Yes. Yeah. So I haven't changed. Dinner I have uh, half Indian and half foreign. You know, like you pork sleep chops well. or something. Do you sleep well? Yeah. I, and, uh, yeah. And on Saturdays, my grandchildren come. Oh no, on Tuesdays, I go to my son's house for dinner with my grandchildren. I have a, one grandson, granddaughter, my son, 
and uh, grandson with my daughter. And I, on Saturdays, we uh, order fruit from outside, Chinese or Thai or something. I remember uh, in the mornings you wake up and go through your journal work yeah. and you're also open to telephone calls from patients. Yeah. Uh, that's been your uh, custom. Yeah, I don't uh, I give my number anymore because there are too many people who ring me. But I read the journals. I, wait, uh, I either wake up at 5.30 because there's a class at 8 or, or uh, operation or 6.30 on Tuesdays, 6.30 and 6.30 on Tuesdays and Sundays. Now, how was your tenure as a surgeon in Ames? Uh, who promoted you and who prevented you? I came back to Ames from directly from America. I had no idea of what India was like. But they had kept a little, that E-type quarter, 700 square feet. And my wife had a grand piano in Calcutta. And my, which was shipped and taken to my drawing room. And the <laughs> grand piano occupied half the drawing room. and. I remember because Pranoy and his wife stepped for the first three weeks under the piano in our, in our drawing room before they became famous. And uh, the problem with me was that I was a very bad surgeon and I had not much experience of surgery. And uh, although even by that time I had published about 20, 12 or 15 papers, quite not bad, on thyroid lymphography, nerve supply of the spinal geromater, various other things. But, and I done research on, oh yeah, yeah, pancreatic secretion and all that. But I couldn't operate. And, oh yeah, I was also on gastric acid secretion. I did some work. And I was very miserable. And um, one day, after a month or so, Dr. B. N. Tandon, who I should always be grateful to, you remember him, um, was walking in the foyer in the All India Institute saying that we have a patient with portal hypertension who needs an operation, a shunt. And I didn't had. I had helped Linton, the great Linton, and Malt do shunts, two or three, line renal shunts. Never done a porticable shunt in my life. And I didn't know what to do. I couldn't sleep that night. I didn't know whether to go to the um, mortuary practice, but everyone will know. But then I went and I did uh, the shunt it wasn't that difficult and they've still and I've filled in a form which they still have in the All India Institute and it was in April 1975 and uh, the person did very well and after that they started sending me uh, emergencies you know varsial bleeding and in those days I used to do a cryals procedure, which was thoracotomy and stitch up the varices from inside, open the esophagus. And people in uh, all India never did all this. And out of the first 11 patients, seven died. And people used to say that, oh, he should have an L plate and he should go back to America, a useless surgeon. But then I started doing liner illustrations which started being successful. And out of the first four to seven patients, many extra hepatic obstruction, that uh, there was a sing not a single mortality. And I wondered why this was. And I realized that it was because they were young 
and they had good liver function. And for people, for India, where a person cannot have access to blood transfusion and have huge spleen and hypersplenism and all that, it is much better to do a one-time procedure. And I also learned that if you persist, you can do what you want. And I realized that Indian problems were very different from Western. And you should do what is appropriate for your country. And we used to do between, in your day, you remember, between 70 and 90 port life tension operations a year. And sometimes at one night, do one <laughs> during the day and then another night. And I tell these people that, you know, we used to be up 48, 72 hours just operating and uh, sleeping in between for one or two hours. So it was very tough, but it was a wonderful experience. But what I didn't like was, because I was not a uh, kowtowing to the bosses, um, I never got promoted. And uh, we lived in the, uh, in the E-type quarters for 12 years. But then gradually we liked it. And my children used to play around in the park in front and we used to watch them from the top. And uh, then you realize that after some time, you can make do with what you have. We were always very poor, and but I had no desire to be rich. Neither had my wife, and but we were happy. And gradually, gradually, I think that uh, because, oh yeah, after I came back, there was a, I'm giving you an anecdote, which you can edit out, there was a selection for senior resident in our department and one person who was way be better than the others we the departmental interview we selected him when he went to the director's interview where the head of the department was he didn't get the job and his head of the departments uh, Chela got the job so I went to the director huh? and I said, this is very unfair and uh, he is much better and he said, write me a letter. So I wrote him a letter saying this one gave that he is much better and he should have got the job. The next day there was an article on the front page of the Indian Express that colorblind surgeon does operations in our India Institute. And I was only partially colorblind, very little. And they said that he takes very long time over his operations. Patients don't want to come to him. And then the uh, everyone said, the anesthesia person said he takes uh, 17 hours over operations and it shouldn't be done. And then they um, set up, they wanted to set up a committee to look into my operative skills uh, headed by the head of department. But then uh, my friend, who wasn't my friend then, Arun Shori, wrote an article in the Indian Express to say the responsibilities of a surgeon, saying what a great background I had. I already done all these shunts and nobody else was doing them. But they took a long time everywhere because it was a very difficult procedure. So that was passed. So all these things made me quite um, um, upset. But my mother-in-law was staying with me at that time and my wife was in Puttaparthi when this thing came out. And my mother-in-law said to me that why should you resign and go back to America? It's this country is yours as much as anyone else's and the institution is, should be yours as much. So I said, I'll stick it out. My wife had gone to uh, Cambridge and then Lord Butterfield told her that if he wants to come back, 
you come back. But I said I'd stick it out, and I stuck it out. And I think that gradually, gradually got used to the system, and eventually, I think that I have been very happy. And looking back on my life, I think that being a doctor in India was the is the best job in the world, and I have to thank mainly my wife that she persuaded me to come back, and my headmaster. You, you are uh, someone who walked the talk and call a spade a spade. Have you toned down in that over the years? No, I think the problem is that because I call a spade, I become very unpopular. But I have—I um, don't like all this corruption in politics and stuff. And we—I edited this big book on corruption, which is a bestseller, and I've, I've uh, alienated a lot of doctors because of that. But I'm. Please, that not that it's made much difference, but I think people. Uh, for instance, we wrote an editorial in the BMJ. No, no, I wrote an editorial in the uh, current medicine research and practice on corruption in medicine, and it was taken up by no the BMJ uh, article editorial written with the present editor. Kamran Abbasi was taken up by 50 newspapers, and I think partly uh, there was a question in Parliament, and partly because of that, the Medical Council of India was dissolved, and National Medical Commission was taken up because of corruption, and there's all this corruption, so we tried to expose it, and I think there's no point in just accepting everything, and you should. I'm I'm quite pleased that that I did call a spade a spade. Now, uh, I don't know whether any anyone has trained more uh, surgeons than you have done in a very proper manner, and uh, you've been uh, your trainees. I think mo almost all the transplant surgeons, liver transplant surgeons in the country, have been your trainees uh, sometime or the other. Now, uh, are you happy with? Uh, uh the way you trained students and no i think when people ask me what uh, i consider my greatest achievements in life i think the people who trained under me and i think that i am most proud of that and is really i'm very happy when people i have trained Say people like you, who've done such innovative things, like uh, YouTube things and getting um, propagating surgical knowledge, and so many other people, and I'm proudest of that. And the second thing I'm proud of is um, helping formulate and do the rules for the Transplantation of Human Organs Act, which has I think changed. Indian medicine. So, what is your uh, take on the associations like Association of Surgeons of India, Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology? Why are they not uh, on par with uh, some of the best societies in the world? Uh, uh, what uh, What is your opinion? Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, the quality of medical education. And the quality of research in India is very low, and we've done a study of publications from Indian medical institutions, and we found that between two th uh, out of 571 institutions, 57 percent of them had not published a single cited paper in Scopus between 2005 and 2014. And uh, I think the quality of research is really very poor, and people get promoted not because of talent 
or achievement, but because of either time-bound seniority, very bad thing, and secondly, who they know. And in All India Institute, and one of the reasons I, I was never promoted in All India Institute was because I never went to a politician or a bureaucrat to help me get promoted. And even Dr. B. N. Tandon told me that everyone is talking about, uh, you know, and Dr. There was a person, MP, Dr. Bhoi, who said that 60 to 70 percent, he was on the institute body of uh, faculty, he used to go to his, his uh, house before um, selections. And Dr. B. N. Tandon said that you operate on so many of these ministers and all that. Why didn't you talk to them? So I said, if I talk to them, then uh, I'll never do that. Even my wife said <laughs> that we are, we are floundering around in this house. Why don't you go and talk to uh, the cabinet minister that who's loved me? There was a, one cabinet minister whose name should not, or H. K. Bhagat, who I'd operated on. And after I operated on him, he told me to sit down. He told everyone to go out of the room and he said to me, I'm very grateful to you, you've saved my life and I want you to ask me for anything that you want and if I can't do it, I'll get the Prime Minister who was Rajiv Gandhi to do it. So I thought this was my great opportunity. So then I thought, thought, what would I like? You know what I asked him? I said, stop politician politicians interfering in all India Institute. <laughs> so that is the worst thing I could have asked. Yeah. So that is the end of my my political affiliations. So why are uh, central institutions, say even GSH departments, um, why they aren't to the level that is expected, international level, and there are so many private sector institutions have overtaken them. What is ailing them? I'm very sad about that. I'm very sad that I've always been a an advocate of the public sector. And I think that when both of us were in the public sector, it was way ahead of the private sector. And then I was one of the people responsible because Bimal Jalan, I told you, who was a friend of mine, who he was banking secretary or something at that stage. And he said there was someone called Mr. Reddy who wanted to start a hospital. And I said that yeah, in the private sector, big hospital. So I said, do you think we should allow them? So I said, yes, they want a loan or something. So I said yes, because in all India, so the private ward used to have a, a waiting list of about two months and people used to get bribed to get a room in the private ward. So there was a great need for the private sector. So the Apollo started in Chennai and then came to Delhi and uh, it really has changed Indian medicine. And 80% uh, of urban Indians go to the private sector, 70% of rural Indians. And I've written an editorial in the BMJ, British Medical Journal, on the private health sector in India, that people get bankrupt, but the great advances are now done in the private sector. It is very corrupt, but still people go there because the government sector is so underfunded and people don't care about you. At least in the private sector, people are treated nicely and they don't mind, they do mind paying and they get bankrupt, but they prefer that than going to the government hospital. It's very sad. What is the solution to improve the public sector? The solution is to have uh, Hospitals like Gangaram. Gangaram uh, and others are not for profit and you should have it 
run by the board of governors who don't take any money and there's no profit and I'm saying because I'm part of the trust in Gangara and they have a mission to help and we have 20% of beds completely free and 35% subsidized so I think and we encourage academics and research and I'm also the chairman of the ethics committee where we look into any complaint not that we have had <laughs> many complaints because there must be lots of things going on but nobody complains about them and I think like America in the private sector the 80% of hospitals are not for profit and the very few for profit hospitals like corporates because the corporate hospital exists to make money for shareholders in not for profit hospitals there's no shareholders and I think it's much better I don't think the government can afford universal health care because it's too poor but uh, I think not for profit hospitals no, and make and oh, sorry invest much more money in health care like America spends 17% Britain spends 9 to 11% European countries spend 11% and India spends 2% or less than 2% on uh, public spending health care you are the president of AIMS Rishikesh and there are so many AIMS come up and uh, there are also complaints that a lot of these AIMS don't have uh, qualified personnel uh, you, you think that uh, the AIMS are doing good all over or is there any way to improve them? Yeah, that's the problem that uh, most of the AIMS don't have enough faculty and I think the answer would be to raise the pay of the people in uh, AIMS although they are much higher than other public hospitals but nobody there's a study from Maharashtra that they looked at 43 trainees not very big but it's published in British Journal of Social Sciences Research or something and uh, most of them wanted to go to private hospitals and although they wouldn't get much hands-on training and uh, it was not very ethical but they preferred that because they found that the, they could advance much more that uh, in say for a liver transplant 97 to 98 percent of liver transplants in this country are done in the private sector and I've written a lot about this now you are the father of uh, liver transplantation in India I remember the days when you ate, slept and dreamt liver transplantation for years together We mm. used to meet on Friday yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But we used to think that liver transplant would be done mainly in the public sector uh, with whole livers Now it's done mainly in the private sector with partial livers Now uh, you, you are the father of the bill, you worked hard on that and I remember you were visiting the parliament a number of times to get the bill going and you have uh, you are the sort of uh, originator of many of the transplant surgeons in India are you happy with the way transplant is going on in India is it that your dream has come true I think it is mixed I think it's fantastic that there are 140 centers doing transplants liver transplants in India at the moment and the best centers uh, get 95% one year survival and India does about 1650 in 2021 and it's third in the world after in numbers after America and China but I was talking to one transplant surgeon yesterday who would strain with me in Ames and uh, she was saying that all these corporate hospitals have representatives abroad 
Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and they get patients, and uh, but they provide a service. And she was saying that is not not um, completely unethical because they're providing a service, and in some hospitals in India, 90% of the liver transplants are done on foreigners. And also, they have marginal donors. So, and although in the liver transplant, in the Transplant of Human Organs Act, we had a stipulation that the appropriate authority, you must report all the indications and results of transplantation, not only of liver, but kidney, everything, to the appropriate authority, but that's not being done. So there are many centers which probably have very high mortality and there are, very, there are many centers which do much very unethical practice. And I think the vast majority of hospitals which are very successful uh, have these patient facilitators who make it easy for the patient to, you know, you get a donor who's your servant and the um, authorization committee just passes it over, especially in certain states, which can, you know, very lax about checking whether it is paid transfer. Lot of these things happen. But overall, liver transplant has improved Indian medicine great deal. It has improved quality of surgery, anesthesia, blood transfusion, hepatology, but I don't think that it's improved <laughs> ethics. Now, I remember you commenting a number of times that uh, for a vast country like India, there are not enough doctors. Now, uh, <coughs> you also wanted uh, people, paramedical people also to get into some sort of medical training. Now, uh, uh, there are overflow of uh, doctors. So many seats have increased, uh, postgraduate seats have increased. Are you happy with that? Because this is resulting in uh, institutions where there are inadequate staff and improper training. Numbers are coming out, large numbers, but quality isn't there. Yeah, but I think that you have to look at a uh, paper in science written by Abhijit Banerjee who got the Nobel Prize <coughs> from MIT, who looked into training of quacks and he found that 60% of uh, people in Birbhum district in West Bengal went to quacks and they trained quacks for six months and one year. The people who were trained for one year and attended the classes were as good as the so-called doctors. And um, you see nowadays also that the quality of uh, medical education varies tremendously from different medical colleges. And I think it is better to have a poorly trained doctor than no doctor at all. And I think, and I'm a great believer in having a lot of medical schools and gradually they will come up slowly, slowly. There's no point at least they will uh, see the thing about a patient-doctor relationship is not that the doctor has to be reading the New England Journal of Medicine every week, but they have to have a bond with someone who wants to help them. So I am not that against expansion of medical colleges. So where do you get the time and energy for so much of prolific writing, writing books, you know, something and the other keeps happening all the time. Where is, how do you keep that schedule? Don't you want to relax, watch Netflix and go for a walk in Lodi Gardens? I don't like to go for walks and all that. I find it very boring. And I find television and all that very boring. And I spend a lot of time in front of my laptop reading journals or reading interesting articles. And I'm now getting very interested in artificial intelligence. And I look up myself every day 
in artificial intelligence. I found there a lot of wrong information. But people say that it will get better with time. And it's worrying that uh, I think probably it's <laughs> going to take over much of medicine. And uh, in fact, I was going to write an article, editorial on predatory medical journals. You know where you have to give a lot of money and they publish your paper within two days. And I would looked up some uh, artificial AI thing would say, write me an editorial on predatory medical journals. It was a brilliant editorial. So, the journals that I'm associated with now, we have to have a, a clause at the end of the thing to say that you have not, um, this is not copied from artificial intelligence. So, uh, we have uh, done a lot of research in corruption in medicine. Indian medicine as a matter of fact. Now, uh, what is that you got to tell the younger students, um, you know, the so many medical students, surgical students, how to be less corrupt? What is that they shouldn't do? In less? Life? Corrupt. In other words, uh, uh, how, how can they be more ethical and, uh, you know, what is that things that they shouldn't do in your opinion? I think that first, you should do what your conscience tells you. And you should do, go into medicine to help people get better rather than make money. Second is that you shouldn't compromise your principles. I know it's very easy to say so because everyone cuts their ethics just under me. Like I bribed that fellow 600 rupees, for my father-in-law, um, that you should be honest and do what you think is right. And if you do what you think is right and work hard, I cannot see that you will not so-called succeed. So it's been a long journey for you. Are you happy with your journey? Are you satisfied with your life? And out of 10, how many marks will you give yourself? I would give myself nine and a half. I'm very happy with my life. And I was thinking that at my age, when I look back, I find that the main things that you should judge your life as a doctor are patient care, um, training, research and contribution to society. I think my patient care has been okay and in certain things like port life attention and all that, I've tried to uh, inculcate in others that you should do what is relevant to your patient and not evidence-based medicine so-called second trainees and I think I'm really happy that so many of my trainees have done so much better than I would ever be able to do and I feel very proud of that. Research, I don't think I've done that much although not so well because although I've done a lot of uh, papers not all of them have been very high quality but Contribution to society, I think the main things have been books like, um, you know, a series of books. And I think I must have published 40 books, um, including things about corruption, etc. And Transplantation of Human Organs Act. So I think with that, and also I've become president of Rishikesh, which I do quite a lot for, and uh, manage my trust here. And I've got these Lifetime Achievement Awards, and I think I couldn't have um, wished for more in life. And I repeat again that one of the greatest choices I made was that in spite of having a very expensive education 
elite medical schools, Cambridge, Harvard and all that. I came back to India mainly to serve the poor and I didn't completely <laughs> serve the poor but I had a very wonderful life. So on that note, uh, thank you very much sir, it's been wonderful talking to you. I hope to get yet another session, another day for another recording. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Privilege.